The Lord bless you again, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Bible study one more Wednesday evening. So good to have all of us that are tuned in. Um, it is indeed a great pleasure and a blessing to be able to together go through the book of Genesis, a very important, a very intriguing, a very interesting book uh, because we know that it speaks to us uh, about the origins of pretty much everything that we see around us. As we have said, it is a book that is under constant attack because this book presents to us where everything started, the things that we are seeing around us, this old business of salvation that we are in and we are heading to a particular place and all that we see happening being put together and heading in a particular direction. All is happening because of what was outlined in the book of Genesis and as a result, uh, today things are happening to take us to what we now understand to be the logical conclusion to what started in Genesis. Now, because Genesis presents itself as the beginning of all things, it is where everything that we know originated, family and uh, humankind and all the things that we see around us, the light, the darkness, the planets, Everything that we know, that we see, that we experience had its origin right in the book of Genesis. And if we are going to be believing that what happened in Genesis is correct, if we are going to be accepting that what happened in Genesis is so, then it means that if Genesis speak about God creating, it means that there is a God and as a result of that there are folks around that will try to discredit the book to disassociate anything to do with God having anything to do with the beginning and so the book of Genesis is constantly under attack everything that can be found that can be used as an instrument to discredit and to make light of factual things that are shown and recorded in Genesis. Anything that can be used is being used, yes, to show that the book cannot be trusted, to show that the things that are written in it cannot be accepted, that they cannot be believed, and if it can be so shown, then it provides a basis on which people can say there is therefore no God. And so maybe the scientists, maybe those that hold to the doctrine of evolution, maybe they are right and things might very well have emerged as a result of some process of evolution. But we are taking our time as we go through the book of Genesis, brothers and sisters, to show that the things that are being put forward to discredit this book, and of course, if it is the foundation in terms of the Bible, this is where it all starts, then if you can damage or discredit or put aside the origins, the foundation, then everything else that is built from Genesis would have nothing to stand on. So you can therefore discredit the Bible. That has been the aspiration of many to discredit the Bible and show that there is no God. But we thank God that there are those who, as we go through the book, we realize more and more that there had to be a God. Just look at humankind. Look at the intricacies of our mind function. Look at the intricacies 
of all the things that has to happen. Do we really sit back sometimes, brothers and sisters, and look at how we work, how we function as a man, a, hu a, a woman, just generally humankind? Do we or have we ever taken the time out to look at the interconnectivity of all the parts of our system, the brain and its connection to the heart and its connection to every other part of the body, the vessels, the blood vessels that we have, the veins, how the blood is pumped by the heart, how the blood goes right through the entire body and that blood takes food to the brain, to all the cells, it saturates the cells and provides them with food. Do, have we ever taken the time out to know that when excesses from the cells are pushed out, it is the blood that comes and cleans it up and then takes it to a point to the liver, to the kidney where uh, a process takes place and there is cleansing of the toxic material then it passes out through the skin then it passes out through urine and there is a, a complicated set of things that happen to keep us functioning as humankind did we do we realize that each one of us as adult humans have a, a couple of pints of blood and over a, the period of our life our heart pumps, if we understand, I don't remember the exact figure, but the amount of blood that is pumped by the heart over the lifespan of an average uh, individual, we would be surprised at what happened. Are we aware of the DNA that is in our body and all the things that are contained in the DNA? It is from the DNA from the chromosomes of the chromosome of the man and the woman when they come together and that child is born and we send things over to this child that comes from us and all of this is locked up in the human body are we aware that the intricacies of the operation the the, the sequencing of everything it moves literally like clockwork. Do you honestly believe, saints of God, that this could happen by chance? I humbly submit that it takes a genius. It takes an intelligent mind. It takes someone with a much higher power a higher degree of intelligence and understanding to put something together like this to make it happen. Statistically, it is virtually impossible for such intricacies to come into being by chance, by buck up. It is virtually impossible statistically. And yet, those that believe in evolution and want to convey that and to say to humanity this is how you got here it amazes me because even the evolutionist has to have faith to accept that what these scientific persons are telling them that there was a big bang and out of nowhere something just happened by chance for them to accept that they have more faith than I have, and many of us have. It is easier, brothers and sisters, to believe that God created the heavens and the earth. And so many of the skeptics jump into the book of Genesis and look for everything to discredit and to disprove that the book can be true that it can be trusted, that it is historically correct and therefore can be used as a book, as an instrument to demonstrate the reality of a supreme being. They pull things like, all right, so Adam and Eve was made from God. One man, one woman was our mother and father. How is it that in this 21st century then we have so many races 
so many nations. It is impossible for that to come from one common ancestry. Now, brothers and sisters, we will examine the position put forward by these folks as we do our study and see if it can stand up to what is written in the Bible. The Bible makes it clear that we are all today who we see on the earth common ancestors. We come from a common ancestor and we come from one blood, from one parent. And the Bible makes that emphatically um, and expressly clear. Can we trust the Bible? So when we get to that, we will show that in the Bible, the proof is there. In Genesis, it is there that we are from one. And what we call races, we are going to show us that it is just one race, the human race, Adam's race. And we will show you just how, and it is right in the book. So don't be pushed aside. Don't allow for anyone to cow us down that we are believing in a lie and that there is no God. I want us first to extend our faith and entrust, put our trust, sorry, in the word that God did. Don't try to find out where God came from. He didn't tell us. And in Genesis 1 verse 1, where as it, the Bible tells us where everything originates, it didn't tell us. And God chose not to, to tell us where he came from. I guess somewhere in the future, he will disclose and discuss that with us if he so desires. But for sure, that is something that those that are skeptics have pulled to say it could not be and therefore the Bible is wrong. Then secondly, uh, and this is just second and third and fourth just on my little scale, not in any order, I'm just discussing with us some of the things that um, skeptics use to try to disprove and to invalidate the Bible and if they can successfully do that then they can remove God. And I'm telling us, as we speak today, in the United States, in many other places, they have successfully done that because they have infiltrated the schools, the public schools, and have placed in the curriculum evolution as a uh, subject area or a part of a subject area so that it is infused in the educational system and then and therefore infused in the minds of children that we evolved and we were not created if you can get that into the school system brothers and sisters then it is just a matter of time that we will be um, having folks graduating from institutions institutions that taught them and impressed and instilled in their mind that is at the time would have been infertile and then growing into fertility and planted in that mind there is no god you evolved you came by chance and then start to go through the process with these youths until they grow up into adulthood believing that there is no God. There is a systematic attempt. There is a systematic plan. And it is in many places across the world. A whole lot of folks in the world that you and I are in today believe that there is no God. But the very things that they use to discredit, we are going to look at and show that, in fact, what they are saying is not so. One of the other things that they look at, apart from the race or the nation, the origin of nation, and why are there so many people or so many nations or so many uh, races, as they call it, uh, it shows that it, we could not come from a common ancestor, and therefore this Adam and Eve thing that we tell people about is not true. It is fairy tale. It is just a story. And we have to be careful how we, brothers and sisters, talk about the Bible and talk about Bible stories because it, it somehow comes across as 
the Bible is just a book of story. Just like when you read a storybook, and many of the things that you read in the storybook, you know, you read your children, bedtime stories, you find a storybook about Cinderella, uh, some fairy tale. Many folks see the Bible like that. Just a book of stories with fairy tales to talk about angels did this and a God did this and people did this and you're going to be in heaven and live happily ever after. Notice how they use storybooks to talk about the fairy princess and all of those things and Alice in Wonderland and who live happily ever after. They use some things from the Bible. They put it in a storybook fairy tale format and speak about that so that if we read into the Bible as Revelation would put it, that a time is going to come when the former things would have been passed away. And as we go beyond, it will be an eternity where there will be no more sin, there will be no more crying, there will be no more pain because the former things are passed away. They then present that as fairy tale and links it to the point in the fairy tale episodes where they go off into the horizon and they live happily ever after. We as uh, adults know that in many of these stories, when we read that they go and live happily ever after, it is just a fairy tale ending. And so they have now aligned that, parallel that with the Bible and show that the Bible ends just like a fairy tale uh, story that you read to your children. And as such, they present, they equate, and ultimately present the Bible as a book of fairy tales. But that is the work of Satan. That is the work of the enemy to try to discredit the book. And that's why we have taken the time and we have kind of looked at the spread of Genesis and we started to see even how Genesis was built up. Right? Last week when we met, we looked at creation and right into creation God also planned and had the salvation plan right at the time when he was creating he had the salvation plan in his mind and so in the evening and the morning as we said when he did his creation it was similar in redemption the evening and the morning they Things were created in six days, evening and the morning being the first day, evening and the morning when the second day came. In the same way, when it was time for redemption, in the evening and the morning, they had the first Passover and they left Egypt in the evening. And then the morning when they reached the Red Sea, the Red Sea opened up and they crossed on dry land. And by morning time, uh, it came back together and swallowed up the armies of Egypt. Uh, later on when Jesus came, he was killed in the evening and by uh, Sunday morning he rose at which time our salvation was complete. It is just as we start to look at the book, we see some things that indicate to us that even in the book of Genesis, there clearly was a conscious mind, a genius mind, a a powerful mind that sees all things and knows all things and could plan the thing simply because God knows the end from the beginning and he could put things in place in a systematic, orderly, logical way and to the extent that when we look back at what happened, we can see a mindset planning and orchestrating thing in a certain way to quietly tell us somebody is here and is in charge and have, has made things to happen and to be executed the way that it is being executed. The power behind it all, brothers and sisters, is God Almighty himself. And I'm happy that we can take the time and go through the book of Genesis to see God at work. Now, one of the things that the skeptics um, tell us, because they have used the scientific um, analysis and they have taken studies and they have done a lot of things and they have tried to use this now to prove that the Bible cannot be true and to de therefore discredit everything that is in Genesis, one of the things they have used is the existence 
of some prehistoric, pre-human animals, so they say. And of course, this is talking about the dinosaurs. Uh, they have done, these scientists have done, uh, in scientific jargon, uh, things that they call carbon dating exercises, where you can take something and through a particular process, using a particular methodology, you are able to determine how old a particular rock is, how old a particular fossil is, you know, like a, a bone from an animal. So you can take up a rock, carry out a kind of test, carbon dating test, and use that scientific test to estimate that this particular rock was a hundred million years old. You can get a fossil, a piece of bone uh, that you uh, discovered while you were on an archaeological tour at a particular site, probably somewhere over Mount Ararat. You remember where the ark rested after the flood. And we will come back to that because there are folks that argue that there could not have been a worldwide flood. But we will get to that. But folks have been in those areas and they have found fossil bones of animals past. And some of these bones are huge. So that based on what they have found, and we know this because we have seen it based on what the scientists have shown, they have found bones that when you put them together and kind of reconstruct the animal based on the size of the bones, based on all what you have got together, based on the size of the rib cage, they reconstruct that animal and they get something that is a humongous monster. And they then go on to carry out the process of trying to determine the age based on the, the, the dating methods that they probably might use, that they believe is most appropriate for that. And based on what they come up with, they can determine that it is a hundred million years old. Now, this is what scientists have used <clears throat> to show to us that the Bible is wrong. Because we have gone into the Bible and we have seen when we read in the Gospels uh, that we start to trace our ancestry and go back to Abraham and then continue to trace our ancestry and go back, all the way back to Noah and from Noah trace our ancestry and go all the way back to Adam. And of course, if we can go back to Adam, then we are at the very beginning because Adam, the Bible says, and Eve is our parents. But that can be traced based on Bible and going all the way back and showing who was Adam and who was the son of Adam and coming all the way down. We can go all the way back and show the ancestry. And that has proven to be a couple of thousands of years ago. However, scientists tell us that whereas we are suggesting that humanity have been on this earth for a couple of thousand years, the, fossil few, the fossils that they have found, the bones that they have found, the, 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 the fossils they, that they have found embedded in the rocks all around, when they do the aging process on these fossils, they show that these animals have been around for 75 million years. It therefore means that the animals 
were here before recorded history. It means that, and that's why they are called prehistoric. It also means that the animals were here before man was on the earth, and so they are pre-human. And it therefore means that the Bible is wrong because the Bible declares that Adam and Eve came and that the land animals came at the same time round about when Adam and Eve was created. And if Adam and Eve was created a few thousand years ago, based on the ancestry that we have looked back on, what we saw in the book of, in the Gospels, if we go by way of that, they are telling us that your Bible is wrong and Genesis is wrong because if Adam was here only a few thousand years ago, these animals that we are seeing today that are huge and, and we have their bones, it is showing us by the test that we are doing that they have been here for 75 to 100 million years ago, long before humankind ever came to this earth. And then they died out. And so the Bible cannot be right. Further, they say, if these animals coexisted with men, there would have been a problem. Because these animals were major flesh eaters. And mankind could not survive on earth at the same time that these dinosaurs existed. Otherwise, there would have been lunch and breakfast every day. And so this story in the Bible is incorrect. Furthermore, they say, the Bible did not even mention anything about dinosaurs. And so the Bible didn't even know that these creatures exist. So you see, they say the Bible is a limited book. It doesn't have everything. It doesn't know everything. These are just man-made volumes put together, but they have no accuracy. They cannot be validated because we have proof that the dinosaurs were here millions of years ago, long before the Bible, and the Bible did not even know that they existed. It did not mention dinosaur by name or anything like that, so the Bible is limited. But we want to go back to Genesis, brothers and sisters, and look again at what was written there. We want to go back and not only go to Genesis, but go to other scriptures to see what the Bible has to say about these gigantic creatures that men today say the Bible had made no mention of, didn't know anything about, and therefore is lacking in its content as to what reality was way back there. I want to submit to us, brothers and sisters, based on what the Bible says, because that will have to be our starting point. Never start, brothers and sisters, with what the scientists say and then fit that into the Bible. We discussed that last week. We always start with the Bible because what God says in his word, I can surely advise, is the fact. What God says in his word must be the basis upon which we start any investigation or any study or try to enlighten ourselves on any position. We must start with the word of God. Any approach to understanding a particular thing, any approach to understand a particular event that is world according to the worldview, if we start with the worldview and then try to fit it in the Bible and it cannot fit, we are going to be bound to disprove and put the Bible aside. You cannot put the Bible aside on the basis 
of what men say. What it is suggesting is that you are establishing what men say as the basis upon which the thing must start. It cannot be on the basis of the word of man. I humbly submit to all of us that it must be first. It must be essentially on the basis of the word of Almighty God. What does God's word say about some of these large animals? No, they have presented to us that you have dinosaurs and you have the different types. You know, you have some that were land animals and they roamed the land. You have some of those dinosaurs and they had different types of names. And some of them were sea animals. Some of them look like uh, massive birds and had a serpent look and they were sea animals some of them and they were actually tribes across the earth if we go across the earth and we look at the carvings on certain rocks if we go to India if we go to China if we go to Egypt we see things that are there inscribed on rock formations inscribed on different things and they show some massive looking creatures with fire coming out of their mouth where did these people get these images from that they could carve them in rocks these things seem to have been around when people were here contrary to what many scientists would want us to believe and so we are going to take our time and we are going to just look at a few things. I want to show to us that dinosaurs, these large ferocious monsters, were here and they were a part of God's creation. They did not evolve by themselves millions and millions of years ago. They were not here before humankind so that it is only after they passed out that men eventually evolved no if god made adam and eve first adam and eve was made first if the bible said at a particular day the land animals came then the land animals came man said these creatures did not coexist with man they were here millions of years before man came here the bible said that they coexisted and we therefore need to look now to see if in fact there can be any reconciliation. But, brothers and sisters, we begin with the Bible. And so, I'm going to just take a few moments and look at some scriptures and present something to us for us to understand some basic things, very basic, but it, it sets the tone for us to recognize that a lot of the things that folks, scientists have pushed at us for us to hold on to and use it to prove that Genesis is wrong and the Bible is ridiculous. Brothers and sisters, it is not so. The Bible speaks to a lot of the things. We talk about the sea monster. We talk about the land monster. We talk about dragons. If you look in Chinese ancestry and Chinese tribal culture, you find them speaking about dragons. You find them speaking about dragons that spew fire from their mouth. They, they, in, and in other countries, it speaks about the same thing. And you see the symbols, you see the animals drawn with fire coming out of their mouth. Is this just mythology? Or were there such things called dragons that were ferocious and that were had fire coming out of their mouth some of them were coming from the sea some of them were land as we said and these were things seen in different cultures because we see it over in asia we see it over in the east and the middle east we see it in other places even in african culture we see things drawn and information passed down about a great flood and a whole lot of things happening brothers and sisters if all different cultures can have accounts of similar things it is saying that something must 
have happened in the past and these people were together and when they eventually left or dispersed or went their different ways they left with different parts of what they knew had happened before it cannot be that these things were just made up by people who were spread so far across. Remember, there were no airplanes that in those days that people could take a flight and pass their information to them. They must have been together at some point. And we are going to show that they were indeed together at some point. And some things happened to them, which was common. And then they all left with their stories. And it is right there in the book of Genesis. And we therefore do not need a uh, scientist to tell us what was happening. It is right in the book and we can accept and we can believe the book. I want us to look at uh, a few slides because I want us to examine this whole thing about dinosaurs. It is the big thing that, it is, that is being used by many to discredit or to try to discredit the validity of Genesis. They try to say Genesis is a storybook. The things are not real. They don't even know about dinosaurs. And look how everyone in the world today, brothers and sisters, including me, because I believe in dinosaurs, including many of you, you believe in dinosaurs. They have found the bones and they have reconstructed them and we see the big massive creatures. Their tails are so big if they swing it, it can tear down major structures. They say, how did the Bible not speak about dragon, uh, dinosaurs? It just didn't know. I submit to you, no. And they say, again, they were there before humankind. I submit to us, no. They were here when we were here. And they were in fact here. And there are such monsters like dinosaurs. And the Bible spoke about them. But we'll show you why probably you don't see the name dinosaur in the Bible. And the fact that you don't see the name dinosaur in the Bible doesn't mean that the Bible didn't speak to them or didn't make mention of their existence. And so let us look at a few slides as we go through or we continue to go through the book of Genesis. All right? We... we want us to understand, and I said it before, it is important for us to use the Bible when we are making these explanations. You don't fit dinosaurs into the Bible. You don't find out what it is that people say and what it is that the, uh, the scientists say and what it is that are what you would call facts. And you find the facts and then to see if the Bible can accommodate those facts, and if the Bible cannot, then the Bible is wrong. No, no, no. The Bible is the word of Almighty God. Always understand that, brothers and sisters. Always start from that vantage point. Always commence your study journey with the fact that it starts with God. He is the foundation. It comes from him. So use the Bible to explain dinosaurs. Don't use dinosaurs to explain the Bible. All right? No, we said God said everything that he created was good. And that is indeed a fact. We have no doubt about that. God told us that he made everything in six days. And we will revisit that because some folks say it's not six literal days. It's, it's, it's like six million years. Every day really was a million years. Others say each day was a thousand years and so forth and so forth. But when you honestly read Genesis, brothers and sisters, you will realize the evening and the morning uh, was the first. You'll realize that it was one evening and one morning, uh, which made up one day. So that, And then when we come down to um, the seventh day, you see he rested on that day. And then coming forward, he gave Israel the seventh day as a rest day. You realize that when you do the connection, these things were really talking about the day that we now have. So he made everything in six days. Now, on day six, as I indicated earlier on, 
he made the land animals. He made man and he made the land animals and everything. Of course, a lot of folks cough. The, the scientists scoff at that and say, impossible, because we have done our thing and we, have, we can clearly and safely say that these animals were here. What you are saying that God made the land animals on the sixth day cannot be because we can prove at even more than you that these animals were here millions of years ago and long before men came. But I want to ask God one question. And the question comes from a scripture in the Bible. And it's from the book of Job. Job chapter 38 and verse 4. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. The question is, based on what Job 38 and verse 4 say, because when God laid the foundation, you know, when God created the morning stars, you know, and the angels and they started to sing up to that point, he did not even start on the earth as yet. No man was there, no, no, no animals were there, no trees were there. Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding so that my question to these folks who are trying to dismantle the word of God by submitting that 75 million years ago, this is exactly what happened. Were you there? According to Job 38 and verse 4, were you there? And I can stand here this evening and answer you and tell you, no, you were not. And you might ask me the same question, and you have a right to ask us who believe in the Genesis account the same question, were you there? And we honestly have to answer you, no, we were not. So none of us were there. But I know someone who was, and I have his word. And his word has a lot to say about that. So we are going to read his words and we are going to find out and understand, right, what exactly is contained in the words. Now, most folks don't realize that the word dinosaur is a new word, relatively new word. It's not like dinosaur was a word that was coming from way back thousands of years ago and all of that and in the early writings from that we now have and translate from we would have found dinosaurs dinosaur the word dinosaur was never there in the time before Christ the word dinosaur wasn't even around when the church came about in AD 33. The word dinosaur wasn't around when the Apostle Paul and all of those were roaming the earth and preaching the gospel. Dinosaur is a relatively brand new word. It was first used by Richard Owen in 1841. That's about the time when my great-grandmother was around. So that you will get the feeling when you hear some of these folks talking to you that the Bible didn't record dinosaurs. It was not stated there. It means that the Bible didn't even know that such creatures exist, which means that the Bible does not know a whole lot of things that happen. But brothers and sisters, no. The Bible couldn't have spoken about dinosaurs when the word dinosaur wasn't even created, What didn't even exist until 1841 and it was coined by a man who tried to find a term to describe the monsters that he the monstrosity that he saw when they discovered some fossils some bones of a massive creature that we had not known about before so in the 1800s when they made the first discovery of some of these massive bones of these great creatures, yes, they coined a term that describe these mammoth animals and they called it 
dinosaur. This was in 1841, right? And so we must understand that. Now, he created, the, he coined these words, I believe it was from some Greek word, dino and soria. And it simply means terrible monster, big monstrous animal or massive lizard. Because they have, if you notice what we have seen when we put the bones together in terms of those dinosaurs, brothers and sisters, it had this lizard-like look with a big tail at the back and a long neck that goes up, you know, like a lizard is standing up, those iguana-type lizard. Where if they stand up on the two uh, legs at the back, they have this tail extending and the head up there and the body going up, which can... So it has a kind of lizard look. So based on the look of what the reconstructed beast would be, based on the bones that they have found, they use some Greek word dino and soria to coin the term dinosaur that refers to this monstrous animal. And this was in the 1800s, brothers and sisters. And it is important that we look at that date stamp. Because the English translation of the Bible that you and I have, the King James Version that we use, was not even printed. At that time, it was printed long before the use of the word dinosaur, long before they coined that term. So that when the first Bible was printed, which is in 16, on 1611 AD by King James, the word dinosaur didn't even exist. And whatever was in the Bible was a word, certainly, that would describe how the Bible described these large beasts and large animals. But it wouldn't have been dinosaur because in 1611, when it was being translated, whatever it was translated from, they did not have the word dinosaur there. So it could not be in the Bible when the word dinosaur wasn't even yet coined. As I said before, and I'm showing it there, it was only in 1841 that the term dinosaur was coined and actually, actually used. So, make no mistake about it. You will not see the word dinosaur Amen. In your Bible, it was 230 years after the King James Version was printed that this word was coined and came into use. The question, however, is, is there anything in the Bible? Are there any terms, any words that the Bible used to describe any of these kind of large beasts, these mammoth animals that uh, was referred to as dinosaur by others when they are there anything, any words that the Bible used? The answer is yes. There is an old word that means the same thing. Now, we have heard many stories, brothers and sisters, about dragon. Oh, they, in the old days, in medieval times, there were some big creatures that were called dragons. And even the Bible speaks about dragon. Uh, today, we hear people say these animals were not real. But were they? Because the Bible constantly makes mention of dragons. The Bible talks about dragons in different ways to kind of show how mammoth they were and how ferocious they were. And it actually used the, the, the dragon as a land animal or a sea animal in a symbolic way to refer to the enemy and to show that in the same way how you have these big mammoth animals that everybody, everything is afraid of, but God can conquer. He used these massive animals as a symbol to show Israel that even if your enemy comes in like this and come upon you like a dragon, as big as the dragon is and as powerful as the dragon is, 
I am able to conquer and defeat them for you. So that these massive mammoth beasts were actually recorded in the Bible. But the name dinosaur was not used because dinosaur is a relatively new name. It was coined long after the Bible was written. But the Bible speak about dragon. As I said, some people say that they are not real and they have not found any bones, but the very bones that they have found that they have called dinosaurs, brothers and sisters, I submit to us that it is the same thing because a dragon is a massive beast that is huge, that is mammoth, that is massive, and the description is the very similar description as that of a dinosaur. Could it be that the same kind of humongous animal is being described that the Bible called dragon? Is it the same? Could it be the same thing that Owens, when he coined the word dinosaur, could it be the same thing he called dinosaur? It is obvious, brothers and sisters, that the same mammoth beast the same large, massive animal that is called dinosaur. It is the same thing I submit to you that the Bible calls dragon. A much older word, but it describes the same thing. And it was around at the time when humankind was here. They roamed the earth together. And so, there are a few scriptures that I'd love for us to read together. And let us look at Jeremiah 51 and verse 34 and, and see how Jeremiah puts it. Jeremiah 51 and verse 34. We want to see how Jeremiah put it because it's, it's here in the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured me. He hath crushed me. He hath made me an empty vessel. He had swallowed me up like a dragon. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a massive major king, the king of Babylon, the head of gold. He was the most powerful of all kings. Yes? And therefore, when, if it is said that Nebuchadnezzar crush you, you know, and, and swallow you, it means that Nebuchadnezzar represented a mighty, mighty world power. Huge, large, had the capacity to, to, in one swoop, take up a large amount of prey. And so, it is important, it is important for us to understand that he is looking and describing the dragon as Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, a mammoth force at the time, a massive military power, the, 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 the most, the greatest of the world powers is, and it's very important that we understand that. So here is Babylon, the big world power. It can swoop up any world powers around. And he, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon is being compared to the dragon. It is telling us something about the size and the ferocity of that animal, of that beast that the Bible is describing. So here it is that he's talking about the dragon. That word could have easily, brothers and sisters, been dinosaur if the word was around before. It is talking about a massive beast that can swallow up and it is compared to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who was the massive world power that anywhere he went, he just conquered and swallowed and devoured and destroyed. This was dragon or dinosaur, if you please, I submit to you, a massive land animal. And this is exactly what the Bible is talking about. It mentioned these beasts it literally mentioned these beasts now there are some other scriptures 
that I want us to read. I want us to take our time and to look at it together because I'm making the point, I'm submitting to us that what was called dinosaurs and what was called suggested that they live long before humankind, I'm submitting to us that it is the same thing that the Bible speaks about. So for those who said the Bible didn't talk about dinosaur, you're wrong. It did. It's the same dragon. And we just read from Jeremiah. Now look at what Job chapter 40, and I believe verses 15 to 19, has to say about these massive creatures. Behold, now behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. Lo now his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Right? His bones are as strong as pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. Or in other words, that term chief of the ways of God speaks to being the largest, the most massive of what God has created. In other words, he is the largest of the beasts that has been created. He that made him can made his sword to approach unto him. Brothers and sisters, I want us to take a look you know, at what is being described here, how Job is describing this massive beast. The description, and if we go back to verse 15 at the start, the description that is being given here is, notice he's called, behold now behemoth. That terminology means massive, massive beast. And Job is suggesting that God made him the massive beast. This massive beast, and when we look at the description, it is a description not unfamiliar to how they describe the dinosaurs. When we look at the description that men give, especially in the distant past, when they are describing this beast that they call dinosaur, that they say has been around for 75 to 100 million years before their extinction, and they were here before humankind, they say the thing is massive, they say the thing is bones are like iron. When they look at the bones, they say, no, nothing could crack those bones. And they start to give the description that they call dinosaur. But notice that Job who calls the creature behemoth, he did not use the word dinosaur. Whatever word was used was however describing the same massive beast that scientists today are referring to as dinosaurs. And it says that his strength is in his loins and his forces in the navel of his belly. So he's, he's kind of giving a description of how massively powerful he is. And look here, Job now in describing this massive beast speaks about his tail. And I want us to take time out and stop at verse 17. Because if you're going to talk about the dinosaur, what the dinosaur, what characterizes the dinosaur, you know, apart from his massive bones, that scientists describe as being like iron, which is exactly the term that the Bible used to describe the bones of these massive mammals. He moved his tail like a cedar. Now, folks, the cedar here is a tree. Do we understand what a cedar tree is like? Do we understand how huge how large, how massive a cedar tree is. And in describing this beast, Job said that his tail, not the body now, you know, 
the tail remember in most animals you know you ever look at take a time brethren and look at a dog look at his tail look at a lion look at his tail the tail is always very small in comparison to the animal himself so you look at a massive man eat a lion look at the tiger which is one of the largest cats which is the largest cat look at his tail and look at it in comparison to the tiger so that if you can see the tail of a tiger you can know how massive the animal itself is no Job is saying that his tail is like a cedar. None of us in our lives have ever seen a mammal with a tail the size of a massive tree going way up in the air. The cedar which they cut down to make the lumber for massive projects. The tail of the behemoth that Job is describing is like a cedar. That falls in line with the exact description that the scientists are presenting to us as the dinosaur and so when men tell us that it is not described in the bible and the bible didn't know about them here is it for us the behemoth the dragon that can swallow up it is in the bible and there are other scriptures that we will look at. So that I want us to understand, the brothers and sisters. I want us to be clear in our minds that the Bible is not misinformed. The Bible knows. The Bible literally knows that these beasts exist. Yes? And that they are there. And though they did not call them dinosaur, they used the term dragon or behemoth. And there's another one that later on we look at where it's called Leviathan. And when we see the description, we know that this is nothing less than the massive beasts that these folks scientists are talking about to make us believe that the bible didn't know about them job 41 and verse 1 and in fact whereas we have verse 1 here i want us to read a little bit more because there's another scripture which is job 41 and it gives further description and let me tell you the scientist tells us that their dinosaurs are, are mammals that they roam the land and there is a particular species that roam sea. They're in the sea and they come out of the sea and then they come on land. So that is like they are sea monsters and they are land monsters. And this is frightening. And these are the things that the scientists will tell us. And they say the Bible does not even mention the name and therefore has no clue and we are showing you the fossils, the bones of these animals. So that here it is. The Bible is uh, what you would call it now. The Bible cannot be trusted because it has left out an entire species of one of the most powerful group of mammals that ever lived on the earth. How can you then use the Bible as a means of saying that this is what transpired on the earth it is impossible so they say but i rebuff that and i say the bible speaks to the very things that the scientists speak to and i want to describe some more from the bible the very thing that the scientists say these big large animals do uh, they, it's as if they want to drink out the river. It's as if their tails are so massive and they are so powerful in terms of what they do as animals. And listen to how the Bible describes it. Let us read a couple of verses from Job chapter 41 so that we can understand clearly that the Bible knows and describes and shows that these things were 
here during Bible times. They were spoken about in the Bible and they were here with mankind, not millions of years before men, as they would let us believe. And so here is Job talking in chapter 41, and listen how he describes. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? So clearly, Leviathan, as we start to look, we are going to see that this is a massive man, monstrosity in terms of animal or mammal. And it is being described by a man right there in the Bible. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put an hook into his nose? Or bore his jaw through with a tongue? These are rhetorical questions, you know. Because the writer is indicating that no man can do that. Or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Will thou take him for a servant forever? So God is now saying that this monster that is here, none of you can talk to him to try even to control him. It's just me and him. Will thou play with him as with a bird? This is God talking and how God treats with Leviathan, the massive monster. He will just play with him like him playing with a bird. Whereas for us, it is a frightening beast. Or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him amongst the merchants? Can thou fill his skin with barbed irons? Or his head with fish spears? In other words, God is rhetorically asking questions that are making you know that these things uno cannot do it. This is such a massive beast. It, it is I who will have to deal with this beast if he is to be dealt with. Lay thy hand upon him and remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare to stir him up so that there is nothing on earth that is fierce enough that can dare to stand before this massive beast. Who then is able to stand before me? So not even the fiercest is able to stand before this massive beast called Leviathan. Who hath prevented me that I should repay him whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. And I'm just reading through, I will conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment, or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a closed seal. One is so near to another that no ear can come between them. They are joined one to one. And I'm just reading, you know, because I want us to get the gist and understand the massiveness and how ferocious this thing is. And this is describing exactly what men today call dinosaur. I am telling you, as I don't want to go anymore, you can read it later on, but it goes on to talk about, so we'll go back to the slide. It goes on to talk about when he lay in the river to drink, it's as if he's going to drink off the river. When we look at his tail moving, it's as if the tail is wagging like a major, massive cedar tree. Brothers and sisters, this animal is in the bible described and it is important that we know that the bible not only spoke about land dragons you know it also spoke about sea dragons so that some of these things are on the land just like what the scientist tells us these dinosaurs are land animals but there is species of them 
that thrive in the sea. And Psalm 74 and verse 13, we would have to have the time to read it. Isaiah 30, verse 6. These speak about not only the land dragons, but also the sea dragons. These are real stuff. And one of the arguments that the scientists put to us is that if these dinosaurs, if these massive creatures were here, when men were here, we could not survive to be around today because they would have devoured us. But Genesis 1, as we go through and look at verse 29 and 30, just make note of it and read it later on. They literally tells us that these creatures, God made them to eat vegetation. Whether it is the, the dinosaur who we call Leviathan, who the Bible describes as dragons, whatever the description, they, whether it is the, the elephant, you look at what the elephant eats, you look at what the massive, um, one of those, what, those that King Kong represented, or that represented King Kong, you know those great baboon gorilla? Yes. They just go, they're in the jungle and they're not eating man, they're not even eating flesh. If they do that, no, it's because of sin. But they, even now, they look around for berries to eat. These massive animals that you think are so big that they have to eat so much to keep and to stay alive, they eat vegetation, berries, leaves, herbs. In Genesis 1, so that when the scientists tell us man couldn't, sustain life if they were around that is not according to scripture because the scripture said they were not man eaters they according to genesis 1 they ate the herbs of the land so again we are seeing that what the scientists would have told us that life couldn't be sustained if they were together with man the bible is suggesting opposite and they did not eat flesh they actually had the vegetation and the herbs and all of that it was only after the flood because even mankind even humankind ate from the produce of the earth it was only after the flood in genesis chapter 9 you know brothers and sisters remember now god destroyed the entire earth god destroyed the entire earth with a flood and I want us to remember that it was only after, it was only after the destruction, men became wicked. We know all that transpired, all that was happening down the line. Uh, men were living to be hundreds of years old. Men, we hardly heard about a lot of sickness. Not that it wasn't there, it's just as it probably might not have been written, but the, when we look at the lifespan, when we look at life expectancy, we realize that a lot of the things that bedevil us now today as humankind, it was not there then, right? They lived for extremely long time, hundreds of years, and they ate from the ground, the vegetation, the herbs, everything now sin became so rampant that god came and pronounced judgment upon mankind all before that time they ate from the earth they ate the herbs the vegetation everything but it was after god destroyed the earth after god did what he did after god totally decimated the entire earth and left no and his family and of course the animals that were in the ark when that episode was over and they all came out god gave the the edict the instruction that they could eat flesh but prior to that no such thing so the coexistence of these mammoth beasts along with man Clearly, based on what we discussed before, it, it happened and clearly there was no need for man to fear that these mammoth beasts would eat them because at the time, according to Job 40 and verse 15, according to Genesis that we just read, they were only eating of the vegetation, of the herbs, of the things that came 
directly from the earth in terms of plants. They were not flesh eaters and therefore they were no scare, they were no threat to humankind. This is Bible. This is word. This opposes what the scientists say, but we are showing how the thing can be reconciled. And so I want us to look at the slide again. I want us to bring the slide again. Yes, it was only after the flood we were told to eat meat in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 3. And so it is important that we understand it. Now I want us to note a very important point, brothers and sisters. And I have noted it here on the slide. The, the scientist tells us that it is after the extinction, after dinosaurs became extinct, that humankind came. The dinosaur died, you know, disease came, whatever it was, they died out and then mankind came. But this is contrary to scripture. And it is always important for us to know what the scripture says. Because well, I'm saying all this and I, I'm using this so that we can rivet in our minds that the Bible is correct and the Genesis account is sure and the Genesis account cannot be wrong. The Genesis account cannot be wrong. So, death and anything that came about where death is concerned or anything like that if man was not here and god had made animals before adam came those animals could not have died they could not have died because sin is what caused death and there was no sin there was no sin on earth at that time if man wasn't here if god didn't made man if adam wasn't here then there was no sin they didn't sin and therefore sin could not cause death it could not come upon the earth if man was not here so according to romans chapter 5 and verse 12 it is only after sin that death came and not only to man you know, but everything around the animal kingdom the sea kingdom the, all the mammals in the ocean yes the animal kingdom humankind the plant kingdom after sin only after sin did death come Right? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. So sin only came after humankind. What's the point I'm making? The point I am making is simply this. The scientists cannot be right if they say that the dinosaurs were before man. Because if God made them before man, and it is man that caused death, then this dinosaur should have been living, living, living right down until Adam was made. And at the time when Adam and Eve was made, before they sinned, the dinosaurs would have been around. Could not die because sin was not yet in the world. But the, the scientist tells us that the dinosaurs died millions of years before man came. Impossible. They could have only died as a result of sin. And if Adam and Eve wasn't here, sin was not yet here. And they would not and could not have died. And I'm telling us that something is clearly off with that. So that Adam and Eve had to be here. The dinosaurs and those mammoth beasts had to be here with them. And while they were all here after Adam sinned, then that is when sin and death that came as a result with sin would have caused certain animals to, to start dying. And clearly, some things would have happened that would have caused the dinosaurs to become extinct and nothing different from what caused other animals to be extinct. Brothers and sisters, do we understand that as we speak today, 
as we speak today, there are animals that are about to become extinct in our lifetime, our children and grandchildren later on in life sphere. Some of them will not even know. They will only read about polar bears. They will only read about certain breed of lions. Did, do we know that the white rhinoceros as we speak today is on the verge of extinction before many of us pass this life? They are going to become extinct, never to be seen again. So that folks say, how can a massive creature like a dinosaur, a species like that just die out and disappear? The same way how the white rhinoceros, the same way how certain species of tigers are being destroyed, are becoming extinct, are just disappearing from the sea now. It is the same way that it happened over hundreds, over thousands of years ago. Whatever it was that happened, it happened and they became extinct. Now, the question is, further to show that the Bible cannot be right, Noah built his ark and there were dimensions given by God to Noah according to Genesis. And the scientists say he was given the dimensions and he built. If the dinosaur was so big, how did the dinosaur hold in Noah's ark? You Christians are crazy. Right? Remember the story. Uh, God was going to destroy the earth with a flood. He was going to, you know send the flood and he was going to start all over again god gave the instruction two of every kind and we're going to come back to kind and we're going to differentiate it later on when we're looking at the origin of races and how things spread out we are going to come back to this but two of every kind were to be brought into the ark and god allowed for that to happen and two of every kind not not two of every species because species and kind is different. You know, some folks will tell us that millions of species are there. If you bring two of every species, it couldn't all in the ark. Of course it couldn't. But the Bible did not say two of every species. It said two of every kind. And in one kind, you can have many species. And we'll come to that. But I'm going to tell you that these scientists are trying to get to us. And I want us to understand that the word of God is it, it's in the book. So, two of every kind, brothers and sisters, were to go into the ark. Now, God allowed those that were to come, because Moses couldn't go look for them. He wouldn't, um, Noah couldn't go and look for them, sorry. He wouldn't know. So, clearly, they followed instinct, and God would have allowed for that to happen, and then Noah direct them into the ark. Now, anybody know the size of a kangaroo when a kangaroo is born? Anybody know the size of a kangaroo when a kangaroo is born? Most of us don't. But I've learned, I have found out that a kangaroo, when it is born, the baby kangaroo is the size of like a, a peanut in a shell or a big a piece, a, a little bean. It is so small. The size of a kangaroo is like a bean. And yet, when the kangaroo becomes an adult, it is huge in comparison to what it was when it was born. Similar to the mustard seed, it's the smallest seed. But then, you know, when it is grown, it is the biggest of herbs. So that, that big kangaroo that we know, when you see the baby kangaroo, you, you cannot believe that that baby can become so big. If, if you see some men that are now, look at those basketballers, they are, some of them are seven feet, eight inches. I think one of them reached seven feet, nine. Massive. And when he was born, he probably was just eight pounds, little. But they grow to become massive. But they, did, they weren't born and then became seven feet nine in 24 hours. 
No. And if I am going to play some things in the ark, and if I was God and gave the instructions to Noah to build the ark to a particular dimension, it was to be this long, it was to be this high, it was to be this wide, and all of that. Then when time for the dinosaur to go in, we're not going to make an adult dinosaur go in if I was God. And I am sure that I am not smart like God. If the dinosaur is small and the dinosaur grow, then why wait till the dinosaur become adult and become the behemoth that can hold in the, in, in the ark? If I were God, and I want two of every species. I go and take a little preteen dinosaur that can run go in the ark and sit down and comfortable like all the other animals and can hold. And if he comes out and grow after that, no problem. Remember, it was about 40 days and 40 nights, you know, month and a half. The dinosaur wouldn't become an adult in such a short time. So that the, 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 the skeptics and those that are around that say, how could a dinosaur hold in the ark, brothers and sisters? You don't need daddy dinosaur to be there. God is not stupid. So he allows for that dinosaur at a size that is right to be accommodated in the ark. And only a month and a half they spend. I don't even think that in a month and a half, it probably grow two feet. If so much. Yes, you saw God wise. And all these skeptics come with these things. We know that a, an adult couldn't hold there. But, Bible says two of every kind. Brothers and sisters, the Bible is right. And a preteen dinosaur, of course, I use the term preteen to show saying small enough could easily hold. And not only that, the argument is if two of every species was to go in, it couldn't hold, rightly so. But as I said before, it is two of every kind that God says. And when they work out how many different kinds they are, which we will get to later on, it works out at about a thousand. Some work it out at about 1,200, 1,400 the most in terms of the different kinds. Not species, no. Species can run into millions. Kinds is just a thousand. And if you have two of every kind, that is 2,000. And if it says 1,400 kind and it's two of every kind, that is 2,800. The size of Noah's Ark could easily hold 2,000, 6,000, 7,000 animals easy and have a lot of space. So that putting it into perspective, even Christians before believed something was wrong with the description and the Genesis story about the ark because the animals couldn't hold, because they would have been too big or too plenty. No, you wouldn't need an adult elephant to go in. And if God was going to use those to repopulate the earth anyway, why would, he, why would he use some old people? If I was God and they were going to become the nucleus of the new to repopulate, I would have put some youngsters that when they come out now, them young and them full of vim and vigor and vitality and vivacity, not some elder who reach them peak and going, no. So enough space was there, brothers and sisters. Based on the kinds, we had anywhere between three and 6,000 animals. And the size and description of the ark shows that it could easily accommodate all of that. So put aside the skeptics. Put aside those who try to tell us that it was impossible it is possible. We only need to look closely at the scriptures that is outlined and we will see that the Bible is always correct. And incidentally, I must just drop in here that that situation with Noah 
was effectively showing us again in Genesis God's plan that even when there is going to be judgment there is also room for salvation every time in so many different instances in Genesis God shows that everything that he's doing with the creation experience he show salvation redemption with judgment that was coming because the judgment with the flood that came on the earth there was the ark and there was a remnant there was a set that was saved and the ark literally was a type of salvation so that while judgment and destruction is taking place there is a place of safety see john chapter number 10 and about verse 9 tells us right st john 10 verse 9 tells us jesus said i am the door and it is important that we understand that the ark had one door and the ark's door was opened and the different kinds of animal were going in yes they were going in and look judgment came destruction came but those that went through that door found salvation they were saved they were covered they found salvation and until the judgment had passed over and i i couldn't i didn't want to jump over and not mention that as we go through genesis no matter what we are describing no matter what we are looking at we always see it and in every part every facet every area of dead things every area we see that god literally whether it's in the creation he shows you redemption with it whether it is in judgment he shows you redemption in it as in the case of noah's ark so brothers and sisters that is very important and i really really wanted us to see that the floods came and all life died except what was in the ark and that is extremely 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 important and i wanted us i literally wanted us to 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 see that i'm going to gear up now to to close but there's one other thing and i want us to get to the last slide i just want us to get to the last slide because these uh skeptics these agnostics these scientists these folks who believe these folks who present that the bible cannot be trusted the bible is incorrect the bible is wrong the bible cannot be trusted they do all of these things and say all of these things on the basis that um, on the basis of education on the basis of education they, they use education they use scientific means they use every means to say that it is not a faith thing these are proven things these are things that are real these are tangible things they are not and so i say they are not because we have shown that the bible spoke to some of the very things that they say are not in the bible now one of the things that they use to to discredit the bible when i the scripture that i read from what you see there in job chapter 40 you know verses 15 to to, to 19 in job 41 where we read some of those scriptures 
those verses earlier on, they say that when the Bible was talking about these large land animals, if you look into some of the newer translations, brothers and sisters, where you see behemoths and where you see Leviathan and where you see these big dragons, they remove those terms that were there in the Bible. You know what they replace them with? Animals that we know today. So that they say that what the Bible calls Leviathan is an elephant. And what the Bible calls behemoth and the dragons are hippopotamus. And those kind of things. Animals that we are aware of, these big animals. And so when you read into the newer translations, you find these things. Things that are there but remember now when we had the discussion earlier on we said based on what was written in the book of Job Job described Leviathan the behemoth the large animals Job described them and in the description he said that the tail is like the cedar. Now, these skeptics are not even smart. They're trying to let us believe and they, they somehow take out the big creature and put in another big creature to let us believe that the Bible still is not talking in any way about the dinosaurs or that type of animal. What the Bible is talking about is just some big creatures that we know like the hippopotamus or the elephants that is what they are presenting so they have removed these terms and put in animals that we know and so when you look in the new translation in job you see them talking about the elephant and the hippopotamus as opposed to leviathan and behemoth and all of those things but the bible said that what job was talking about what the Bible actually described, brothers and sisters, as these large beasts. In Job 40, it says that the tail are like the cedar. Now, I'm going to show us right now, and I'd, I'd love to bring it up, the tail of an elephant. I'd love for us to look at a hippopotamus. Look at that elephant. Look at his tail. That's pretty, and that's a, that's, luckily we found a big enough tail too because some elephants have their tail much smaller than that. Does that look like a cedar tree to you? Does that look, that don't even look like a, a, a little baby pine tree? So that these guys are not even smart. They should have found another animal with a big tail. But they can't. So they look for a small animal and hope we don't notice that these have little tails. But if you think this tail is small, I want us to look at the big hippopotamus. And compare it. Compare it to... Now look at that big... That's a hippo. And I want us to look at this tail. My God, what a big cedar tree. That tail looks like something out in Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon that grows way up in the air. No, no, no. They have replaced and put into the new translation these kind of animals. So as to give the impression that this is what the Bible was talking about. And that the Bible does not contain anything about dinosaurs. That the scientist says the Bible speaks nothing about. But they are wrong. None of these animals have tails like cedar. And so we can debunk what they are saying. And go back to the Bible. And if the Bible said that their tails were like cedar. Then it is speaking about that same big animal that they have found the bones. The fossils that show the bones that are in the tail. And I can safely say to us eh, that... The behemoth, the dragon, the leviathan that it speaks about is referring to none other than that massive beast that men today call dinosaur. It was in the Bible. It is no fairy tale. God knows what he is doing. It is in the word of God. 
and so we can debunk all that we have been hearing about the Bible cannot be right because it doesn't even know that dinosaurs had existed. That is totally, totally incorrect. Totally incorrect. So we thank God that this word is here in his book that literally shows that these things, these animals were actually here. I don't care what anybody told you. Debunk them. Push them out of your mind. Push them out of sight. And understand that the word is the word. And coming out of this book, we are seeing that contrary to what these skeptics have been telling us for us to try to minimize and put aside the book of Genesis, all that they are teaching us in science about these dinosaurs, it is already mentioned in the book called the Bible. Genesis is right. So we debunk that. But we at least let us start. One of the other things that they use, brothers and sisters, to tell us that, you know, something is wrong with your Bible. Because... You, you talk about races, you talk about different groups of people, and you say that your Bible curse Ham, and as a result of that, people became black as a result of that curse, and that the black race is cursed, and that is why. We have slavery today, and notice everybody of black people are slaves. And it is your genesis that caused all of that. As a result of the curse, a set of people became black. And this cursed race is the race that black people are a part of over in Africa and everybody use them as their foot mats. Your Bible says this and cause this and cause people to be black and etc, etc, etc. But I want to submit again to us, brothers and sisters, that God did not curse anybody and that curse caused a particular race to be black. In fact, there is only one race, <clears throat> and that is Adam's race. And we are going to show that when we get to the origin of nations. But I want to debunk the other thing and bring some enlightenment. Have you ever heard that since? The curse of Ham? The curse of the black race? Let me debunk that. And we will start, but I will have to stop soon. So I want us to turn to the slide, and I want us to, I want to ask us a couple of questions quickly as we, sorry, at least start, because I want us to understand that all these things are evident in the book of Genesis, and we are going to go through them one by one by one. It all started in Genesis, and we are going to go through them and clear the air so that we are on top of things and we can feel confident that Genesis is the book of beginnings, it is the word of God and every other book stands upon this strong foundation. My question to you is, what was Ham's sin? Notice, and I might say this to us now because everybody's talking about Ham was cursed. Was Ham cursed? And we are going to look at the Bible. And I want us to turn quick. Well, before we turn, it is important to know that nobody was cursed and became black. And that black, the black race is so because they were cursed. We are going to use Genesis. We are going to use the Bible. And we are going to show you that there is no such thing. 
So to clear, because there are Christians right now who are apostolics and feel that their race is cursed and the constant pressure that them under is because they're black. But did you know that Ham was not cursed? Do we really know that it was Canaan that was cursed? But hold on, before we even, let us turn to Genesis chapter 9. And let us look at some things. We can't even see. We can only start and we're going to go into some things that we are going to be shocked. What at base and what we learn that actually happened. We are going to be shocked. Right? There, so there is nothing that is wrong. Nothing that went wrong that caused somebody to be black. It was not a curse that caused anybody to be black. No, no, no. That is nowhere in the Bible. And yet that is what skeptics have used to throw at Christians and because we do not know we leave thinking things that are not in the Bible just like we said last week that skeptics say Cain went to Nod and found himself a wife there the Bible didn't say he found a wife there the Bible says he knew his wife there. Remember we spoke about that? And we must look at what the Bible says, you know, because folks take it and turn it at you. And if you don't know, you believe the thing and then you start to believe that the Bible is presenting wrong information. When the Bible speaks about a man that he knew his wife, it simply means that he went into her and they had sexual activity, sexual intercourse. But you, he could have had his wife, which he did from, from before. And it is when they went to Nod that they had sexual activity and then children came. At Nod, but he didn't find her there. He knew her there. So understand the word, brothers and sisters. So here it is that Genesis chapter 9, verse 18 says, And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So remember now, before all this, before this, they came out of the ark, every other man had died. So this is now Noah and his wife, Shem and Ham and Japheth. And understand, only three sons. The Bible didn't even in the scripture didn't even tell you about their wives. Because sometimes, you know, how the Bible describes ladies, it kind of gives the story of the men. And you, you will have to understand that the wives had to be a part of it. But the sons of Noah went forth, that went forth out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Note that, we're going to come back to that. Very significant. But I'm just going through. So three sons came out. These are the three sons of Noah. And of them was the old earth overspread this is bible you're not going to take what man say and fit it into this brethren we are going to take this and fit other things into it because of these three sons of noah was the whole earth populated all the nations of the earth came out of these but notice that it said the three sons were shem and ham and japheth and noah began to be an husband man and he planted a vineyard. And we're reading down to verse 29. And he drank of the wine and was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan. Again he says Ham, the father of Canaan. We're going to come back, you know. Saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Clearly it seemed as if he, done some, he had done something very wrong. This is more than just looking are seeing, but he figured something seriously wrong had been done. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. Brothers and sisters, saints of God, who was cursed? Not Ham. Ham, Japheth, and Shem were the three sons of Noah. But Noah said, 
curse be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So God did not curse Ham. He cursed Canaan. But who was Canaan? Canaan was the son of Ham. But then Ham had four sons. Well, probably more. But at one point, Ham had some sons. One of Ham's sons was put. One of Ham's sons was Canaan. One of Ham's sons was Cush. One of Ham's sons was Mephirele. I forgot his, the pronunciation. I'll get that for us. But he had four sons. And one of them was the father of the Egyptians. It was Mephirele. Put was another son. Canaan was the father of the Canaanites. Cush was the father of those that settled below Egypt, at the bottom side of Africa, which is the black Africa. So that Cush was the father of the black Africans who settled across the region called Ethiopia, Sudan, and those places, the black Africans. Ham's son Cush was the father of the black Africans. But Noah did not curse Cush. Noah cursed Canaan, who was the father of the Canaanites. Where then did this thing come that the blacks were cursed? Cush was not cursed. Canaan was. And Canaan was not the father of the black Africans. And so I wanted us, and I want us to get that cleared up in our minds. Nothing is wrong with those who are dark-skinned. Your skin was not dark because God cursed you. He did not curse Cush. Canaan got the curse. The question is, why was Canaan cursed? Why not Ham? who saw his father's nakedness. And we are going to get into that. God's willing, next week I realize the time is upon us. But I wanted to start and to clear the air that Cush, who is the father of the black Africans, was not cursed. So black people are not cursed, contrary to what many would try to put into our mind. And this is coming to us straight out of the book of Genesis. Of all the sons of Ham, it was Canaan that was cursed, not Cush. So don't let anybody tell you that again, and we just looked at that. But we're going to look at why Canaan was cursed. Because why was he cursed? It was Ham that did what happened and saw his father's nakedness. And yet, it is Ham's son that became cursed. Why? And we're going to go into Genesis to look at the curse of Canaan. Now I started with the introduction by saying the curse of Ham because that is what everybody keeps saying. But it wasn't Ham that was cursed either. It certainly wasn't Cush. Nor did Noah curse his son Ham. It was Ham's son, Noah's grandson, Canaan, that was cursed. Why didn't Noah curse Ham if he was going to curse anybody since it was Ham that saw his nakedness? Why Canaan? We're going to go into it. We're going to study it. And we're going to see, because some folks are saying, God is impartial. This little one, Canaan, never do nothing. Is him father do it. Why God curse him? And it kind of leaves something in the back of our minds. So just to get us started, Ham was not cursed. The black race was not cursed. Canaan, who was cursed, is not the father of black Africans. It was Cush, who wasn't cursed. Canaan was the father of the Canaanites. And notice every time God said, wipe them from off the face of the earth, from back there, and him vex with Israel when him do follow his command to do that, we are going to get into it and we are going to see some things happening. And right out of the book of Genesis, 
we are going to learn a lot of things as we look at the curse. So let me correct it now. Not the curse of Ham, but the curse of Canaan. We meet again next week, God's willing, and we get into this curse and understand as we go that don't be worried about your skin texture and that you're from Africa. You are not cursed. Not according to the book of Genesis. God bless you as we wrap up here in the name of the Lord. Father, we bless your great name. You are great and you are greatly to be praised. You are worthy, mighty God. And we thank you for helping us and for bringing us through these simple Bible study series in the book of Genesis. We bless your name, mighty God, and we ask you to continue to open our hearts and our minds. I pray, Father in heaven, that you will allow us to see the truth that is embedded in your words. Have us to learn more and to enjoy the Bible and to drill into it so that we can see the goodness and the graciousness and the might of Almighty God. Bless your people. Hold us in the hollows of your hands. Help us to love your words. Help us to love you, mighty God. We give you thanks. We give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The Lord richly bless you, saints of the Most High God. We thank you for joining us in Bible study this evening. And God's willing, next week we will expand on this as we go into some other controversial areas. But yet, areas which are clearly explained in Bible and we do not need external skeptical voices to try to infuse into our minds what happened and then we try to match it to see if the Bible is real. No, we are going to look at the Bible because we are telling you that the Bible is right and it is real and we will see how the other things fit into place based on a biblical perspective. God bless you. Until next week, in his great and powerful name, praise God. Praise God.